The next speaker, Mr. Zahradil. Thank you, Chairman. We have voted several times about the future relations uh, between the uh, EU and the UK after Brexit. And uh, each time, my impression is that uh, there are always some underhanded requirements that will not be acceptable for the other party, for the United Kingdom. And I'm asking myself why. Uh, my impression, my growing impression is that this is part of our negotiation tactics uh, and escalation tactics ahead of the final vote or perhaps that we even do not want any good agreement with the UK. I uh, really do not want to uh, be too much based on sensitivities and I uh, really want uh, our reports to be more balanced. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Zahradil. Next speaker, Mr. Payne. Thank you, President. The current negotiations with the United uh, Kingdom think that uh, the United Kingdom will be kind of punished, but uh, it seems that uh, it will be the continent that will lose in trade because our companies on the continent need a clear um, environment for business. We need to know the future of uh, free trade we need to hear that there will be an agreement with United Kingdom because this is a kind of uh, hazard with our destinies. So the uh, bad uh, consequences are even deeper. Thank you very much, Mr. Pine. Uh, thank you, President. Brexit will undoubtedly change the European Union and that will affect both citizens and business. And to us Bulgarians and to all Europeans, it is important that an agreement is reached within the shortest possible time to guarantee citizens' rights so that all those hundreds of thousands of Europeans can live without worry about their future. During the last 10 years, the turnover in trade between the UK and Bulgaria doubled to 1.2 billions of euros on an annual basis. And without an agreement, the Bulgarian export to the United Kingdom amounting to 500 million euros would be jeopardized. So it is in our interest to retain the economic relations between the Union and the UK at the present level. And I am certain that other countries have similar concerns. We should leave behind finger pointing and uh, should look with confidence and reasonableness at the future of our relations with the UK. Thank you. And the next speaker is Mr. Baltzor. President, thank you very much for giving me the floor. The European Union wants to punish the United Kingdom and they're trying to deter other countries from leaving the Union as well. And you're supporting requirements which are unacceptable to the UK government. For instance, the jurisdiction of the ECJ after the exit of the United Kingdom. There's also the issue of the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland and Donald Tusk has suggested a solution which would actually take Northern Ireland away from the United Kingdom. There's the all, whole issue of taxation as well. Until the end of the transition period there would be a prohibition on any kind of deals with other countries and the United Kingdom. If the European Union fails to take into account the interests of the United Kingdom and of its people, then what this will mean is an exit of the UK without any kind of deal, without any kind of agreement, and that will truly be a lose-lose situation. Thank you very much, Mr. Boltzor. Next speaker, Mr. Hannan. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank you, as usual, on the swift and sure way in which you got us through this lengthy vote. Uh, the British problem, or from our perspective, the European problem, is very simply stated. Right from the beginning, we wanted to be in a common market not a common government. Even as late as February 2016, if David Cameron had been able to come back with any significant retrieval of power, it's clear that he would have won the referendum. But faced with the choice, the other 27 or the Commission, or from whatever breakdown, it, it was clear that people would rather lose the second largest financial contributor than set the precedent that powers 
could flow back rather than just upwards. So we find ourselves now having to look for such a deal from the outside. And I have to say, there were a lot of voices in this House that before the referendum used to argue for precisely that, particularly among my Federalist friends who used to say we need to find an associate status for the United Kingdom in the market but outside everything else. I understand that people are affronted, that the referendum has jangled nerves, but surely that's still the best outcome for both sides. Plue, next speaker, Mr. Fox. President, we welcome the acknowledgement of the importance of our relationship, our common values, our close connections, and our historical links. We share the aspiration for a strong and effective partnership covering trade, foreign policy, internal security, and areas of thematic cooperation. But we cannot support a resolution which ignores the parameters set out by our Prime Minister. To suggest that the best solution would be membership of the single market and customs union, to pay into the budget and to accept the jurisdiction of the ECJ is to call for EU membership in everything but name. That would mean undertaking all the obligations of EU membership but with no say, which would be neither democratic nor sustainable. Differences remain and tough talks lie ahead, but I believe there is nothing preventing us from reaching a unique and mutually beneficial agreement reflecting the new rights and obligations apart from political will and a sense of pragmatism. It is overwhelmingly in the interests of both the UK and the EU27 to have a unique deal with the freest possible trade and the closest possible security relationship. Let's make it happen. Thank you very much, Mr. Fox. Mr. Selinovich. Thank you, Mr. President. With, the, with Theresa May making it clear that last week that the US success to the single market will be reduced, a hardening of the Irish border becomes inevitable. The risk of this, that this will be a step backwards in a peace process. The Good Friday Agreement strengthened the relationship between communities in Northern Ireland, between North and South, and across the Irish Sea, between communities that had been torn apart by violence and conflict. The agreement was made possible because of the both countries were inter-union. The philosophy of it was when you strengthen one of the relations, you strengthen all of them. The risk now is that by damaging one, we can damage them all. I therefore plead to the negotiators to be careful negotiating the future of the relations. I understand that every side is about to get as much as possible in the negotiations, but if we lost the peace, then the eventual gains are worth nothing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Slivich. Next speaker, Mrs. Clue. And uh, again, we've had a strong... Uh, support for the resolution today from members of this parliament, the resolution on what the future relationship between the United Kingdom and Europe would be. Um, I very much welcome the fact that the situation in Ireland has been underlined again in this resolution, that there should be no hard border between uh, the North and the South in Ireland, and that the Good Friday Agreement in all its forms would be protected. We are now approaching uh, the 20th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, an agreement that was ratified with a large majority of, uh, uh, an overwhelming majority of the people, both north and south of the island. It was supervised by Mr. George Mitchell, US envoy at the time, and uh, indeed the Euro Europe, European unions gave it its strong support and have continued to do that. I very much welcome the comments by the Commission, by um, Mr. Juncker yesterday, where he said Europe stands with Ireland on this issue. And I think uh, that's a very important statement, a very strong statement, and that situation needs to be protected as we move forward to the next phase of negotiations. Thank you very much, Mrs. Thank you very much, Mrs. McAvey. Next speaker, Mr. Austerlitzius. Thank you, Chair. I support this resolution as a blueprint for governing the future relations between the European Union and the UK after the UK's withdrawal takes place. It is important to provide maximum of certainty for our citizens and businesses as soon as possible. Thus, the resolution proposes setting up a well-defined governance framework for a comprehensive association and partnership. It highlights four main pillars for our future relationship, such as economic relations, foreign affairs, security and thematic cooperation.
cooperation. However, if the citizens' rights issues must be resolved on the basis of mutual respect and reciprocity, the future cooperation in the field of security and defence should be based, and I hope it will happen, on the realistic assessment of European security needs. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Austrovicius.